continuing on, thank you for being here. Faith in God makes sense. I believe that so much, and I believe a lot of people are misunderstanding that. So I want to continue that series. I want to talk about start reasons to believe in God. Reasons to believe in God. Now let me remind you some things to get our setting again of where we are in, uh, in America and the Western world today about God. Here are some atheists being debaptized with a hair dryer, sort of a mocking ceremony. I don't know if they were baptized as infants, which means they didn't make the choice anyhow. Uh, their parents did, but uh, they're, they're being debaptized. This shows that, reminds me that there are many who say that they once grew up believing in God and now don't anymore. That is the situation in the West, in America, in Canada, in England, in the other place in Europe, which is becoming less and less Christian places. Uh, let's remind also that the atheists are a group of atheists who are evangelistic and trying to get people to quit believing in God. Here's an ad on a bus, I believe in London. There's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. Well, you know what? I'm enjoying my life already in believing in God. I'm not worrying. You're the one who ought to be worrying because you are saying that you're going to die and that your life means no more than if we squash a bug. I believe that we're creating the image of God and that we, our life continues on. So this is, but this is plays to that in people. Well, there's probably no God. Well, maybe there isn't, see? So they're pushing that. And so we're bombarded with that. We are in America and the West. And then Josh McDowell, when I was a young guy, young preacher, first got out of college, I discovered Josh McDowell. It really helped me a lot with evidence that man's a verdict, that book and other things about him. Uh, he is still traveling around speaking, writing, and he says this, the internet has given atheists, agnostics, skeptics, the people who like to destroy everything that you and I believe, almost uh, equal access to your kids as your youth pastor and you, the parents, uh, whether you like it or not. See, this is, again, the situation we're in now. Sandy used to write, my wife used to write Sunday school curriculum for years for upper elementary, and they discovered that the issues they had to deal with were issues now that used to be with teenagers, but now have moved to middle school. They are discovering, they, they have the media, the internet, and they're reading all these things and seeing all these things and having questions and doubts at an early age. And right now, there is a big push to, just, to get your children and my children and our grandchildren and your great-grandchildren to not believe in God. And that is there. That's the way it is. And we can't put our head in the sand and say, no, no, it's all right. And so we need to be on the front with this also to confront this and talk to them about it. Even our grandchildren, when they're young, they're hearing these questions and their doubts about the Christian church and what we believe and is there even a God? That is the confrontation now for children and young people. So that is the issue where we are. One more I want to see where the issue are. This is a quote from Alexander Shosenitsyn, who was a, a Russian author, Christian, who was in the gulag in, in Siberia for a long period of time in a, in a camp there because of his beliefs in a communist country that didn't want free beliefs. Anybody is saying what they believed, and that's why it's dangerous when we have that here in America also, when we're censored for not being able to say what we believe. He says this, to destroy people, you must first sever their roots. To destroy a people. He knew this was Russia, his home country, and in America too, and in the West. What we're doing now is we're chopping away at the roots. Well, this is a culture and a nation and, and nations that were founded on a belief in God and the Christian God. That's how they were founded and how we have a lot of the morals and beliefs. And now we're trying to keep some of those, but, and, but we're taking the roots away. And if it becomes really that everybody just gets to choose whatever they believe, it'll be chaos and dangerous. And I do, I believe our country is in danger because the chopping away at the roots of what we believe. And so I hope we understand the situation of what we're in. We believe in God, but even we are going to be faced with doubts and assaults about our belief because it's just in the atmosphere today. And we have to understand that. 
So that's why I want to do this series, which I, I love speaking about so much. So today I want to talk about the first reason to believe there is a God. And I really don't want to talk about this one today, but more next week. There is a universe. I believe in God because there is a universe. Everybody thinking person has to ask themselves this question. Why is there something rather than nothing? Did you ever do that when you were a teenager or younger? I remember as a teenager laying out on a summer night looking at the stars and how in the world did this get here? And just thinking about the impossibility of all. Everybody needs to have, Why is there something rather than nothing? And so we have, here's a universe. And we're thinking people have a universe get here. And I believe, of course, from God. Now we really have three... Uh, uh, three, two, one, I forgot my verses. Oh, I love these verses. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display His craftsmanship. When we see creation, we think, well, there's got to be a creator. And here's one of my really favorite verses in Hebrews. For every house has a builder, but the one who built everything is God. Isn't that just a common sense verse? Nobody goes to a house and somebody's got a new house and say, wow, isn't that wonder? Did that disappear here yesterday? <laughs> now, anybody's got common sense knows that somebody went to the, they had to develop the land and get the lot ready and, and took time to build a house. Every house had a builder and he that built everything is God. There is a, everything called the universe. He that built that is God. That's just common sense. Let me look at this uh, cosmological argument uh, for the existence of God. Basically, says this: for everything that had everything had a, a, a cause, God is the first cause. You know, uh, you know, you're looking around here, and you know somebody made the chair, somebody made the table, somebody uh, got the sound system together. You know that. You know it had a cause. It didn't just show up. Now let's think about this. A couple of months ago, we probably all sat down to a Thanksgiving dinner. Maybe you had turkey, like we did, or maybe you had ham, I don't know. Mashed potatoes, gravy, sweet potato casserole, green beans, pecan pie. <laughs> and nobody at the table, I hope, said this. Isn't it amazing? Every Thanksgiving we come together and the dinner's just here. It just appears magically and miraculously we just have a dinner here. Try that next Thanksgiving. See how that flies. <laughs> and Sandy, who does our Thanksgiving dinner, and all the kids and the grandkids around would say, I beg your pardon. I had that turkey out thawed for three days. I got up at four o'clock this morning to get it started cooking, and it was still frozen some. I had to run hot water in the turkey's rear end to get the neck out. Why do they put a neck in the turkey? Who eats necks? And I cooked that thing for hours and I got the mashed potatoes and I had to peel them and mash them and cook the green beans and bake this pecan pie. It did not magically appear. And anybody with common sense says amen, of course. Amen. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> we know a Thanksgiving dinner didn't come by itself, but we think a universe just got here. Quentin Smith, an atheist, the most reasonable leap is that we came from nothing, by nothing, and for nothing. <laughs> really, Quentin? Do they let you out by yourself? <laughs> the most reasonable belief is that it came from nothing? That doesn't seem to be the most reasonable to me. And so William Lane Craig, a Christian apologist, says this. Does he sincerely believe that things can pop into existence uncaused, out of nothing? Does anyone in his right mind really believe that, say, a raging tiger could suddenly come into existence uncaused, out of nothing, in this room right now? The same applies to the universe. If prior to the existence of the universe there was absolutely nothing, no God, no space, no time, how could the universe possibly come to exist? But that's what they believe. If you don't believe in God, that's what you have to believe. That the Thanksgiving dinner cooked itself. 
and appeared magically. That there was no first cause. It just, as he says, came out of nothing. And by the way, did you notice for nothing? There's no reason for it. No purpose for it. No purpose for you. No purpose for your wasted life. There's no purpose for if we all die. So what? Because that's just nothing meaningless universe. We have three choices as to why there is the universe. And I, I sincerely believe this is all I can think of. I'm not trying to pull up, be a snake oil salesman. If you think of another one, you tell me. The three choices we have about why there is the universe, how we got here. Let's look at the three. First, matter is God. If I had a rock, the rock is God. You know, to say, when a lot of people used to believe, even scientists before the 20th century, that the universe was eternal. It was not created. It just always was. I'm going to mention you some reasons why I don't think that flies, okay? From infinity past, we would have never gotten here. If the universe always was, how did we get to 2021? If the universe always was infinity, you know what infinity means? It means on and on and on and on forever. So look, look at this. If an infinite amount of dominoes had to fall before reaching here, they would never reach here. Okay? Now I, got, I know some of you are saying, can we get to the good stuff? Now this is the good stuff, all right? If an infinite amount, or right, let's say you had an angel and his assistant, and he says, uh, oh, you got dominoes falling. Yeah, I'm just watching these dominoes. Well, I've got an infinite amount of dominoes. Uh, well, how many have fallen so far? 12 billion. How many more you got to fall in infinity? All right, he comes back a billion years later, and he says to the angel, how many dominoes have fallen? 10 to the 103rd power. How many more do you got? Still got an infinity. <laughs> do you get what I'm saying? If it had to go forever and ever that way, it would never get to right here. We can't have a universe that existed forever because we have a universe that is in time. And time and infinity there would have never got to right here. All right, while you're stretching your heads and thinking about that, all right, next. And if a universe could, uh, could exist, so this is not the next, if you can agree with that, but here's what question people ask. Who created God? All right, if the universe couldn't exist eternity past, why did God? Got you there. Uh -huh. Well, we don't believe anybody created God because we don't believe in creating God. This is what the Old Testament made fun of. All those people made up their own gods. As a matter of fact, I think it's in Isaiah where it says, you go out to the woods, you cut down a tree, you, you cut it and fashion it and make it into an image. You put it in your living room and say, this is my God. He says, how stupid is that? But we don't believe in created gods. We believe in a God, one God who just is. What did, you remember when Moses was being called by God to go and deliver people out of Egypt. And he said, well, who do I say told me to do this? And what did God say? He says, tell them, I am sent you. Jehovah, it, I am. The verb of existence, I am. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There is the beginning of time and space. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The space and all the stuff in it, in the beginning, that's when time started. What is time? All right, if we have a day. I don't know what time it is now. Let's say it's 1030. But what it does, in 24 hours from now, this, the earth will rotate and we'll go around till we point to, this, to the sun the same place in 24 hours. That's one day. In a year, we go around the sun 365 days and one quarter will be here in the same position as relation to the sun. That's time. Things like that happens, how we matter time. Before the earth and the sun, we didn't have days and years. There was no thing. There was no time. So we, can't, we don't have to worry about it. how to get from infinity past. It just was. There was no time. There was no space. There was no universe. There is God. You say, do you comprehend that? Absolutely not. For me to comprehend God, I'd have to be God. And I'm not just Him. But I, it makes more sense than a God who just is 
than the universe being God, matter being God. I know that's still a little bit, but we don't believe in a created God. Nobody created God. God just is. Before time, there is God. There was no eternity. This is some of the things I already said. And I sort of comprehend that. No, I don't. All right. Another thing that why we can't believe that the matter, the universe, is always was a second law of thermodynamics. You said, would you quit getting into stuff I had in high school? I'm sick of that. But this, this is really, it basically, the second law of thermodynamics is everything runs down. Your house gets dirtier on its own somehow. You know, just things, the more, a le higher level of entropy, disorder, is a law of the universe. Which is why I don't believe in evolution by itself either. But uh, it just, everything runs down. It doesn't increase in higher energy, it goes to a lower state of energy. You've got a battery in your phone, eventually it'll run down. If you don't, then you have to recharge it. So let's say I think I've got a picture, yes, maybe this week with all the ice and snow, you got to take a hot bath. Honey, it's cold, I'm cold, and I'm going to take a hot bath. And you had the hot water, and you, first you got in, you <laughs> All right, there's two things you know because of the second law of thermodynamics about that hot bath. Number one, you know that even if you ran some cold water before it got hot, you're not going to have uh, 40 degree water here and 150 degree water here. Because the second law of thermodynamics, they're going to go together. Okay? Another thing you know is that if you sit in that hot bath long enough, what's going to happen? It's going to cool off. Because that's the second law of thermodynamics. It doesn't just stay hot. It goes to a higher level of entropy, less, less hot. It runs down to the same temperature as the rest of the bathroom. That's the second law of thermodynamics that applies to the whole universe. Eventually, the sun will run down. If you think it was cold this week, wait till the sun's not putting that in. And not only our sun, but every sun in the universe will eventually come to a heat death until everything is dead and cold and lifeless. Which means we couldn't have an infinity past to everything that doesn't run down. There is, it's not matter, it's just God. The universe just didn't, just didn't get here. All right, and, and lastly is the discovery of the universe expanding. And, I'm, and, and there's not going to be a quiz, so don't worry. All right? But do we know who did this? You ever heard of the Hubble telescope? <laughs> Hubble. Evan Hubble, 1929, uh, discovered, he measured. We're not going to read all that stuff. But basically, he discovered that the universe is going like this. Everything getting far away from each other is getting, going like that. Matter of fact, even our solar system is not staying the same. It's, it's moving. But anyhow, what this did is, this showed that it could not be that the universe was forever. It had to have a beginning. So let me give you a quote by, uh, what's his name? Stephen Hawking. Now let's go back to the beginning. Now that you remind me of the name. The expansion of the universe was one of the most important intellectual discoveries of the 20th century or any century. It transformed the debate about whether the universe had a beginning. In other words, now no scientists believe that the universe was just here. Because it's growing, it had to have a beginning. All the scientists now believe it had a beginning. Now they don't know how it got here, so they say it would just poof into existence. All right, so this, 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 because it, you're not going to remember all this stuff maybe, but remember, this couldn't have been true, that the universe is just always here. It had to start. All right, so number two. If the matter is not God, then hydrogen is God. The simplest element, one proton, one neutron, one electron, hydrogen is God. Now here's a great quote that I disagree with. Hydrogen is a colorless, odorless, tasteless gas, which given 10 billion years or so, produces people. People should rewrite the first five Genesis, verse of Genesis and say, in the beginning, hydrogen created the heavens and the earth. All right, so most evolutions do not believe the first thing, that matter is God. They don't believe that anymore than it just always was. So they believe it just poofed into existence. Hydrogen being the way most abundant element in the universe developed over and over time till we got here on its own. 
with no intellect or guidance. Anybody have trouble with that? All right. In the beginning, there was nothing. Which exploded? Another atheist. In the beginning, there was nothing. And that nothing exploded. And here we are. I'm quoting the atheist. I'm not making up this stuff. So, from Caltech, let's just do it. Here's what did they call that. You know what they call it, the Big Bang. So just a short thing from Caltech. According to the Big Bang Theory, the universe began expanding, expanding from an infinitesimal volume with extremely high density and temperature. Now listen to this. The universe was uh, initially significantly smaller than even a pore on your skin. The Big Bang's not an explosion of matter in otherwise empty space. It created space itself with the Big Bang and carried matter with it as it expanded. And physicists think that even time began with the Big Bang. Now notice that. All this building and all of Tennessee and all of North America and all the Earth and Jupiter and Mars and the sun and all the suns and all the dark matter and all the dark energy and everything we see and not only that but all the laws the second law of thermodynamics gravity the force that keeps atoms together all of that was in something smaller than the pore of your skin which got here by itself Now, maybe God did have it that small, because he can do that stuff. But do I think that even the laws, we know laws are written by somebody, but the laws of the universe, they think were just there. They just, the laws that said there's gravity just was in that, by itself. I don't have enough faith to believe that. So either you believe the universe always was, or you believe it started with a big bang, that's called a singularity. That's the thing smaller than the poor skin. So we have to say, where did that come from? Nothing. Nothing. No sense, no reason, no person, no God, no intellect. It just was nothing, and it was something. Again, I've got uh, William Lane Craig says, why is it only that universes can come into being from nothing? Yeah, what? If, that, if things are coming to nothing, why can't I get a big piece of gold in my hand right now from nothing? Why do we have to sit in our living room and worry about is a polar bear going to pop into existence and eat me while I'm watching TV? Does anybody seriously ever worry about that? You need counseling if you do. But you know why we don't worry about that? Because we know things don't pop into existence from nothing. They don't. They never have. But to be a person who is an atheist, you have to believe that universes pop into being from nothing. So William Lane Craig goes on to say, the claim that something can come into being from nothing is worse than magic. When you have a magician pulls a rabbit out of his hat, at least you got the magician not to speak the hat. <laughs> you see, we don't believe that nobody that they really pulled it, there was nothing in the hat and they really pulled a rabbit out of that. But we believe that somehow you didn't even have a magician. And the universe just popped into existence. I'm telling you, when there's dark days of your soul, and you're wondering, why did God answer that prayer? Why did you have to suffer this problem if God is love? Don't you doubt there is a God. Because the other belief besides that is nonsense. And you know, well, I don't know why God is doing what he's doing and why God's not doing what I want him to do, but I believe in God. There has to be a God. And I've got to cling to him. Where else do I cling but to him? So universe of matter is not God. Hydrogen, and it just happened and came by itself and expanded and, and all of this evolved on its own is not God. So... I believe a transcendent, all-knowing, all-powerful being is God. That's the only three choices. If you know another, you tell me. You let me know afterwards. There's a fourth choice. 
But it's either that the universe always was here or it came into being by itself or God created it, the heavens and the earth, in the beginning, like we're told in Genesis. And I believe that. And here's the amazing news. That God that made that universe made you to be like him and live forever with him. He loves you and wants you to be with him. So much that he gave his son. That blows my mind. When I think about how great God has to be. That he loves me. And he loves you. And wants us to be with him. That's the great news. That's the great good news. About God. I want us to. Uh, see. Uh, I think it's two minutes. About the comparison in size. To realize how small stuff is. From the smallest atom. And even the atom is in parts. To molecules and bigger things. To the biggest stars and galaxies. Let's watch this two minute video. That compares water molecule to this antibody. And now HIV virus. Let's talk to him. 